wanna feel like this Living life, no regrets Hands up in the air like ooh Nothing's gonna break my ooh Yeah, I just wanna feel like this What is going on inside out? You guys look great tonight. Turn to the person next to you and say, you look great tonight. Yeah. Um, if you are sitting next to your crush, then uh, you're welcome. I just broke the ice. And if for some reason you're sitting next to your ex, then I just made things really uncomfortable. And I'm sorry about that. Um, but my name is Ryan, and I'm so excited to be here. I love Inside Out. I love what we do here. I love what you guys are a part of. I love small groups. I love everything about it. Uh, in fact, I just got done leading an Inside Out small group. Here's a picture of these guys. They were uh, Lambert and South group. Anybody from Lambert and Woo! South here? A few people. Okay. Um, this was an awesome group. You may recognize them from some camps and uh, mission trips and things. And before that, I led another group, and this is a picture of those guys. They uh, graduated in 2019. And so I've been involved in Inside Out for a long time, and I love what we do here. Beth asked me and the team asked me to come set up the conversation you guys will have in small group. And um, just right off the bat, I want to clear something up. Um, I'm, not, I'm not very cool, okay? I wear black because it makes me look a little bit skinnier up here. And uh, I shop, you know, I'm a dad now, so like most of my closet is beginning to be Costco clothes. And if you're a parent in the room, you get that because it's economical. Um, so I'm not very cool. But, but the reason I think that you should lean into what we're talking about tonight is because, um, one, it's important. But the, for the past 10 years, I've spent time with high schoolers, high schoolers just like you, across the entire spectrum of faith, from high schoolers that wanted nothing to do with God and didn't really care about what we do here. We're just here, you know, chasing the girl or guy that they thought was cute. Uh, all the way to the people that loved God and wanted to know, like, hey, how do I implement my faith more deeply? And as we navigated life together and as I had talked to those students, the thing that I wanted to be true about my life is that I wanted each and every one of those students, no matter where they came from, to know that I am for them. And as I stand here tonight, I want you to know that that same thing is being extended to you, okay? I am for you. I want your life to be better because of the things that we talk about here. We're wrapping up uh, a series called More Than Sunday. And um, in this series, if you haven't been, uh, you are not behind. If you've been on vacation or if this is your first time, you're not behind. I'm going to summarize it right now. Week one, Beth talked about having a more than Sunday faith, a faith that, faith that extends outside of these walls. How do we engage in our faith on a day-to-day Basis. And in week two, Jake was here and he talked about not viewing faith as just another bucket of life that you have to juggle, where you have your school bucket and your work bucket and your family bucket, your friend bucket, and your faith bucket, right? This is looking at life as like, hey, no, everything is about my faith and the way that I engage in my relationships is influenced by my faith, the way that I engage in my school is influenced by my faith, the way that I engage in, in my sports teams is influenced by my faith. And that's what Jake was here to tell us. And then in week three, Ashlyn came and spoke about the story of Daniel and talked about how Daniel kind of faced this, this situation where all of a sudden in, in the time that he was living, his faith was made illegal. And so there were some con considerable consequences that he was facing if he chose to live out his faith. And, and he had this decision to make on what am I going to do? Am I going to live out my faith or am I going to let it fall to the wayside? And tonight um, we're ending with a really important question. And I know it's an important question because for all of the guys that were just on the screen that I showed you for the last two small groups I've led, um, this question created a lot of tension for them. And I imagine if you've been coming to church for a while, this question creates a lot of tension for you. And it's this question right here. How do I live out what I believe? And if you've been coming to Inside Out for a while and you feel like we talk about this all the time, I want to just challenge you for a second. If that's you, you're like, I can't believe we're talking about this again. This is, this is everything. Okay, this is, this is everything because um, the, the reason that Jesus came to our earth is to influence the way that we live. And so living this out is really, really important. 
Um, and, and these guys in my small group, you know, they struggled with this through high school. They struggled with it probably similar to you do, or, where we would go to a camp or something, and, um, you know, you would talk about the camp high. Like, it was awesome. Like, I just feel so on fire for God. I, I love my faith. I want to engage in it on a day-to-day basis. And then, and then the routine of life would start, and, and things would just get mundane. And, you know, if you really stopped them and asked them to think about, like, hey, is that the decision you want to be making or the thing that you want to be talking about? You know, most of the time, they, they might say, well, well, you know, I, I know the right decision. I know what I want to be talking about. But, but life comes fast, and you guys know this. I don't have to explain it to you. Like, life comes fast, and the things that you do, and the things that you talk about, and the things that your life is about isn't always consistent with what you say you believe. And, um, you know, I think all of us in the, in the room uh, would agree with, with this statement right here, uh, that fake is frustrating, right? And I don't have to explain this to you, but, you know, this is everything from the influencer that posts from a private jet and uh, they just rented it for an hour on the runway, you know, to act like they had money. Or maybe uh, this is me in middle school when I went through my skateboarding phase. Uh, did anybody go, th- go through a skateboarding phase in here? You guys are, uh, we got one leader, and the rest of you are, uh, are lying. So um, everybody went through a skateboarding phase. Um, but, you know, this is, this is important because we don't want to be fake. We want to be real. We want to show uh, what we believe with our lives. And, and if you're a Christian in the room, you should care about this because I know you wrestle with it. And if you're a non-Christian in the room, I think that you should really care about this because you should really care about uh, people calling themselves Christian and being able to tell, like, hey, are you the real deal? Are you actually following Jesus? Or are you just calling yourself a Christian? And so tonight we're going to really dig into this and to talk about how do we live out what we believe um, a few years ago, I spent three years of my life going to seminary, and seminary is like a graduate school, so you go after college, and you learn about God and the Bible, and so I spent three years studying that, and I want to share a couple things with you on the front end of this talk that I think will help you as we navigate some scripture together, and the first is this. Um, all scripture is written from a specific person in a specific time to a specific group of people, and so if you open up the first page of your Bible, you're going to read something from one person in one specific time to a specific group of people. And then if you flip to the end of your Bible, it's a different person writing at a different uh, part, you know, season of life, part, part in time, and to a different group of people. And so it's really important to know when you're reading the scripture and as you're navigating it, like, okay, who is the author of this and who are they writing to? And what is that, those people navigating to, to, to know what the Bible is really talking about? The second thing is this. What does the Bible even mean? Well, the Bible... It comes from a Greek word, biblia, which actually means the books or library. And that's what the Bible is. It's a collection of writings. It's a collection of books that actually took several thousand years to be put together. And it wasn't until like the 350s AD that that these writings were actually collected and actually bound in a book that looks like this, that you may have sitting on a shelf at home that we now know as the Bible. But one commonality, and this is the third thing you should know, one commonality that all of these people that, that this Bible was written to Um, had in common is that they all lived in the ancient world. And the ancient world is an actual time period. It's 3000 BC to 750 AD, which feels like a long time ago, but that's why it's so important to understand the context of what these people were going to and how the Bible came to be. And I don't know about you. I mean, uh, for me, I grew up in a a Christian house. My parents were Christian. I, I went to church all the time. And I never stopped to consider, like, how did the Bible come to be? Like, did it just, I, I think I always assumed that it just, like, always was, or, like, always, always around, or maybe, like, fell from the sky one day. But that's not, that's not how it happened. This is real people writing to real people, and it's really important to understand that. And I know the Bible can be confusing, and at Brownsbridge, if it's your first time, just know, like, we try to make it really accessible to you and to explain what's significant about it and how it applies to your life. And I can promise you that's what we're going to do if you come back. So we're going to look at three um, passages in Scripture tonight, and the first one is in John um, eight. And so John wrote the book of John, okay? And John was a disciple of Jesus, so he walked and talked and lived with Jesus for three years while Jesus did ministry, and then spent the rest of his life, the next 30 years of his life, telling people about what he saw. And John actually kind of had a unique audience that he was writing to. He was writing to several different groups of people, but really they were so diverse that we kind of say that John was writing to everyone. And as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, you're going to see them kind of come at the same story from different angles because of the audiences that they were writing to. So this is what John 8, 12 says. It says, I am the light of the world. This is Jesus talking. This is John recording what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus is contrasting something his ancient audience knows really well, right? The difference between 
darkness and light. And, and you know this well, too. Like, you understand what darkness is. But, I mean, we have electricity. And so, like, darkness doesn't mean that much because we just walk in and flip on a switch or turn on our, you know, phone flashlight and we have light. But the ancient world really understood this because, like, they had fire and lamps and those things were accessible, but they weren't easy to use. And, like, if you wanted to, to cast light far, like, you had to just raise it up and, and try to see as you walked through your house and not bump into anything. And, and it was just complicated. And so Jesus is saying, like, hey, the world, the world is a dark place, right? Like, and I probably don't have to, to explain that to you. I mean, you could look at your parents' favorite news outlet or, you know, whatever social media feed you want to or even look closer than that. Look at your own life or your high schools and see what people are navigating and walking through. I mean, from divorce rates and, um, you know, homelessness and, you know, anxiety and depression and suicide. I mean, all of those things have affected my life in some way. And I would assume that for everybody in this room, your life has been affected also. And, and so I don't have to convince you that the world is a dark place. But Jesus is saying, like, hey, I'm the light of the world. I have come to show you the way to live. I have come to expose the darkness. And, and that's another reality when you talk about light and dark is this. We only know light because we know dark. Like, if you had never seen light, you would never know that you were in the dark. If you were born in a cave and you had never seen the light of day, you would never know that you were in the dark. But because you know what light is, if you found yourself in a cave and it was dark, you would say, I need some light. And the same thing goes for the way that we view the world. The, the way that we know what good is, is we know what bad is. And if you're a Christian in the room, I mean, you believe this. Like, you believe that Jesus had said, I am the light of the world, and, and that Jesus is the way to light, to a life that's more fulfilling. He, he is the fulfillment of the things that he promised. And if you're a non-Christian in the room, then you probably are skeptical of that. And at a minimum, though, you have to admit, like, that's a pretty bold claim. So I want to take us to our second uh, passage of, of Scripture, which is in a book called Galatians. And Galatians was written by a guy named Paul, and it, he was written between 49 and 58 A.D. And Paul did not know Jesus personally, although he had a crazy encounter with Jesus that you should read about at some point in time. Um, but what Paul did is Paul was a missionary. And so if, I have a map here. So Paul would travel around the, the rim of the Mediterranean Sea, and he would tell people about Jesus, and he would plant churches. He would start communities of believers. And so when we talk about Jesus' life, most of Jesus' life happened in this area of the world. This is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, Jerusalem. A lot of Jesus' life and ministry happened in this area. And um, Paul, though, had his mission was to go to all these places and share the good news of Jesus. And so he ended up in Galatia, planted a church there, and he's writing to these people after he has planted a church. And, he's, and these people are kind of asking a similar question to what we're asking of how do we live out what we believe. And so Paul is answering that question. He's kind of saying, if you are living out what you believe, if you are following Jesus, if you are orienting your life around the things of Jesus, this is what will happen. It says in Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what your faith looks like when you're living it out. This is the fruit. This is the natural byproduct of your life facing towards Jesus, allowing Jesus to shape and mold you. And this is what Beth and Jake and Ashlyn have been saying. If you make your faith more than a, more than a Sunday faith, this is what will happen. This will be true of your lives. And, and Christians in the room that have made this decision to follow Jesus, don't you want more of that? Don't you want your life to more and more reflect those things? And non-Christians in the room don't you wish that Christians looked like that? Don't you wish that the people that called themselves Christians were actually loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind? And if I could take that one step further for the non-Christian friends in the room, don't you wish your life looked like that? Or at a minimum, don't you wish the people that you interacted with looked like that? Like your, your family or your teachers or your coaches? Don't you wish that your life, my non-Christian friends in the room, was more peaceful and more loving? And don't you wish that you didn't have this nagging feeling inside of you that no matter what you tried to fill it with, your life somehow feels incomplete? This is what following Jesus offers, a fix to that. So we're going to look at one more passage in Scripture. But before we do, I, want, I just want to say one thing. 
Christians get this wrong a lot, right? Like, we are not perfect. We, um, the, being a Christian does not require you to be perfect. In fact, if anybody stands on the stage and pretends to be perfect or have it all figured out, like, you shouldn't listen to them. But what following Jesus is, is daily making the decision to face towards Jesus and allow him to shape your life and allow him to inform your decisions. And just so we're clear, like Christians in the room, that's the responsibility that we have. Like if you call yourself a Christian, that's what you're required to do. Like that's what we signed up for. Like we've already said, like my life would be better if I followed Jesus more. And so that's what we're required to do. And if you're considering being a Christian, I mean, just so you know, like we do what we, we say we believe. Like, we, we live this out. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so I want to look at one more passage. And uh, this is in Matthew. And Matthew, the book of Matthew is written by a guy named Matthew, which may surprise you. Uh, Matthew was also a disciple, so he was with John, but they kind of wrote from two different angles because Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. And uh, this is what Matthew 5, 14 says. It says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a light uh, or light a lamp and put it under a bowl and said they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying, hey Christians, you're, you're the light of the world. You're my plan. Like, like I said that I was the light of the world, I being Jesus, not Ryan. I'm the light of the world. But because I'm no longer here and, and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are now the light of the world. And so don't hide it. Don't put it under a metaphorical bowl. Don't be embarrassed by it. Like, I have given you light in this dark world, so elevate it. Be bold about it. Tell people about it. Think about what could happen. I mean, if, if we actually lived out these fruits of the Spirit and we actually let God shape our lives, think about what would happen if you were more loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and, and faithful. Like, think about what would happen if that was characteristics of your life. And, and maybe you're sitting in the audience, and you're like, this is all great, Ryan. Like, uh, it's cool that you went to school for this stuff. But, like, what does this really look like for me? And this is what I would say to you. I mean, and, and this could be a really long list. But I think, uh, you know, a, a great thing to do would be to talk about what you're learning here outside of these walls. Or, or maybe it looks like um, being willing to, to tell your friends that you got baptized last year but you haven't really told them, and you think they might know because you posted something on social media, but you guys never really talked about it. Or maybe you're sitting in the room, and you're kind of thinking, like, yeah, I've been thinking about baptism, and I just don't really, like, I don't know. And if that's you, maybe that next step is baptism. Or maybe it's as you start thinking about heading back to school, and I hate to bring that up, I'm sorry. But as you start thinking about heading back to school, making the decision that, like, hey, when I go back to school, I want to be the person that sits by the people that have no friends even if it costs me some of the people that call themselves my friends. Christians, if we decided to live out our faith, if we decided to live out these things, like, it would change so much. And, and I want to end by telling you a story about a guy named Nick. And Nick was in my first small group, and I, I'll bring up this picture again. This is Nick right here. And uh, Nick, when he entered high school, um, I would characterize him with two words. He was um, confident. He was confident in himself, and he was curious about his faith. And uh, it was really cool to, to walk with him uh, through life for four years um, and to see God grow him. Um, and in many ways, like, he didn't look very different from any of you guys, though. Like, he tried really hard in school, and he tried really hard in sports, and um, he ended up being good at both those things. But Nick honestly never did any of that for the success or the accolades. Nick did those things to be a light. Nick approached all of those things from a posture of, I want to show the people on my teams and my friends, I want to show them God through my actions. I want to show them that God is shaping my life. And, and what's crazy is as Nick began to focus on these things, those things began to happen. And his life did look more loving and peaceful and patient and kind. And his friends started to notice that, and they started to say, like, man, what's different about Nick? And how do, how do I get some of that? And they probably never would have used those words, but that's kind of what they were thinking. And what's crazy about this picture is sophomore year, there were three of us in a small group room. Me, Nick, and two other guys. And we kind of had this conversation of like, hey, what did we want this to look like? And Nick and those two other guys like took it upon themselves to say, hey, we want to engage people and to show them our faith. We want to not be afraid of being embarrassed or ridiculed or, uh, you know, get the stigma of being that church guy or whatever. Like, 
We want to show people, like, hey, this has brought us life, and it, well, we think it could bring you life too. And so over time, they invited dozens and dozens of guys, and there were probably 30 guys in our small group, and these were just who showed up on our senior Sunday to get a picture. But it was incredible, and, and the reality is, is that God used Nick, God used his decision to live out what he believed, and God wants to use yours too. And that same thing is being offered to you. Uh, what's really cool is last weekend I got to do Nick's wedding, and so um, he married his beautiful wife Cameron, and um, it was awesome. What was really cool, though, aside from the wedding, which was beautiful and amazing, was there were probably 20 guys from our small group that showed up there. And, and as a former small group leader, I just looked out into the crowd, and it was like, man, I see what Nick's yes led to. Nick's yes led to guys that were lifelong friends, that were also following Jesus, that were also living a better life and affecting their families. And so here's my question for, for you guys, and I have a question for my Christian friends in the room and my non-Christian friends. But for my Christian friends, it's this. It's, will you let them? And God wants to use you to be the light of the world or to be the vessel at a minimum that he gets to be the light of the world through you. Will you let him? Will you choose to more and more every day let him do that through you? And for my non-Christian friends in the room, I have this question for you. If this was true, if this was all true, I'm not saying you have to believe it, but if it was all true and you were thinking to yourself, like, man, that kind of sounds good, wouldn't it be worth it? Like, wouldn't it be worth it to orient your life around different things so that you felt love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? I think it would, and I think there's a lot of people in this room that believe the same thing, and if you're in this room and you're kind of thinking to yourself, like, it's starting to click, like, I'm getting it, and, and, and I think I want to take some next steps here, or at least discuss, like, what next steps look like, when you get a small group, I want to encourage you just to speak up, to lean into tonight's talk, to reject the, the thoughts that you're going to have as you leave this room, which are going to be like, man, maybe I shouldn't say anything, maybe I should just stay quiet, you know, like, we'll be out of here in 20, so then I can go get some... Uh, What's the, what's the restaurant, the Mexican place across the street? What'd you say? Oh, no. Moe's. Welcome to Moe's. You know, I'm just going to get to Moe's. Like, um, reject that. And tell your leader, like, hey, I, I want to talk more about this. I want to figure this out. And, and honestly, for all of you in the room, I know we, we had a whole hosting bit about it. But, like, the best thing that you could probably do is somehow make it to Inside Out Daytona. Like, we're going to talk so much more about this stuff, about following Jesus and orienting your life around him, and we're going to have a ton of fun doing it. It, would be, it will be incredible, I can promise you that. So the, for the past four weeks, we've talked about what does it look like to orient our life around Jesus and what will happen when you do. And so I have one final encouragement to you guys before we wrap up, and it's this. Don't hide the light. As much as it depends on you, make decisions every day to orient your life or to ask questions in this direction of what does it look like to live out what I believe. Let's pray real quick, and y'all head to small group. Uh, Heavenly Father, this is really hard. Uh, we're trying to figure this out every day, and none of us have it totally figured out, and I don't even have it figured out, God. And um, I just pray that you'd give us wisdom and show us what a good next step for our life is, and then give us the courage to do it. We love you, God. We're thankful for you. Amen.